if you're a mother, or I'm your mother, like I am as a sister, uh, exhaustion is part of the loving. And this poem, uh, it's a blessing prayer, and I saw the two Irish gentlemen, I saw perfect. One of my favorite Irish writers is John O'Donoghue. He, he has a book called To Bless the Space Between Us. It's a book of blessings. So I'm going to use that for the poems that for exhausted mothers or mothers that have been exhausted and maybe they're free from that and they'll tell us the secret. When the rhythm of the heart becomes hectic, time takes on the strain until it breaks. Then all the unintended stress falls in on the mind like an endless increasing weight. The light in the mind becomes dim. Things you could take in your stride before now become laborsome events of will. Weariness invades your spirit. Gravity begins falling inside you, dragging down every hole. The tide you never valued has gone out, and you are ruined on unsure ground. Something within you has closed down, and you cannot push yourself back to life. You've been forced to enter empty time. The desire that drove you has relinquished. There is nothing else to do now but rest. Patiently learn to receive the self you have forsaken in the race of days. At first, your thinking will darken and sadness take over like a listless weather. The flow of unwept tears will frighten you. You've traveled too fast over false ground. Now, your soul has come to take you back. Take refuge in your senses. Open up to all the small miracles you rushed through. Become inclined to watch the way of rain when it falls slow and free. Imitate the habit of twilight, taking time to open the well of color that fosters the brightness of day. Draw alongside the silence of storm until its calmness can claim you excessively gentle with yourself. Stay clear of those vexed in spirit. Learn to linger around someone of ease who feels they have all the time in the world. Gradually, you, re you will return to yourself, having learned a new respect for your heart and the joy that dwells far within the slow. Another one I could not, uh, not resist is um, from Education for Justice, which is an advocacy group that's been effective for a very long time, uh, especially comes out of the Jesuit tradition. And this is a prayer for May 25th, which is International Missing Children's Day. <laughs> I did not know that. Now it's on my calendar. And I especially chose this because uh, we have the tragedy. Many tragedies out of Border River. And as you know, we had a child who drowned this week. And, um, and I think we've had uh, contact with those parents and the friends of those parents of this child. And there's so many missing children in so many ways. And we know that on either side of almost any border that exists between us. Mary, your own son was missing in the temple. And you experience the pain and suffering of a parent weeping for her child, looking frantically for the lost one. Hear the cries of too many parents whose children are missing in an unsafe world. Christ, you are the shepherd who would not give up looking for even one small lost lamb. Give solace to those who have searched long heavy hearts for the missing child. Give them hope as well as comfort. And for the lost children, we pray that somehow, in their suffering, they too may be given hope to hold on to, that they be given comfort in the dark nights. 
Rescue your children, God, Father, and Mother of all. Rescue those who have been taken from homes and schools, lost on refugee trails, separated from families in conflicts. Hear the weeping and bring them home in compassionate glory. Hear the weeping and bring home our children. Um, I have just a couple of announcements. One is, we have uh, recently reprinted our brochure with updated information, and there are copies on the table. If you have some in a tract rack at your church that are outdated, please um, get some new ones and replace them. And if you have time someday while you're watching The Big Bang Theory or something, Cut those little squares with our logo off the front and give them back to us and we'll use them for stickers on various things that we do. Um, I guess that was one announcement. Our guest today is Matt Lohmeyer. He is the executive director of the San Antonio area JFON, Justice for Our Neighbors. Um, where did he go? There he is. There he is. Please help me welcome Matt Lomar. Oh. Uh, we have a lot of new people here, so I want to make one, one little note. If you're frantically trying to take notes during this time, much of the notes can be found on tiny.cc IWC 2019 05. You can try to have Matt's presentation along with other notes at that location. Uh, we had a San Antonio J J Justice for Our Neighbors who was a speaker back in 2017, I believe. Matt has become the executive director since then. Really are glad to have these speakers. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Um, is that right? Oh, yeah. Uh, this is Matt Lohmeyer. Well, it's a real honor to be here, and I wasn't here in 2017. Uh, but I wanted to share. What's that? The microphone. Oh, you can't? Okay. How about that? Okay. I may start singing, though. Um, I thought I'd be able to see. Does that not project over there? I'll have to do this from memory. I don't get a clicker. Okay. Uh, so, to begin with, and, and let me begin with kind of my goal in life, which is to be on sort of on a quest for coherence, which is not always easy, especially right now. Uh, but I'm also someone who is really influenced by the Golden Circle, Simon Sinek. Everybody remember that sort of phenomenon? Start with your why. So, today I'm starting with my why that I want to share um, before I get into sort of telling what's happening with JFON right now. But why we're doing it is really important and it, I think it's probably going to resonate with everybody in this room. But I begin with this, I'm a, uh, I'm a Gen Xer, so uh, movies are how I experience the world. And Schindler's List, the end of Schindler's List, we can't show the little clip because it just didn't work out right in the uh, setting. Uh, but if you remember the scene, they've just liberated the camp, Oscar Schindler is making his escape, and he's approached by, I forget the name of the gentleman, um, and they give him a gift in thanks for what he's done for the people. And he has this kind of meltdown at the end. <laughs> and he's melting down because he realizes he could have done more. And um, Ben Kingsley's character says, you know, the Talmud says, if you save one life, it's like saving the world. And it's not enough. He's, he's just, he's, and they embrace him. And, you know, he tries to remind them that generations will live because of what you did. But he realizes he wasted so much. He could have done so much more. I realize we're also trying to focus on self-care and the work we do. But we want to leverage more people to have that sort of attitude that Oscar Schindler had. Um, or at least as it's presented in the film, I'm sure that never 
actually took place in the way it's presented, but it's an important uh, sort of starting principle. It's just been sent me a whole bunch of information, and I thought this really helps to tell that story. And so what they do is try to respond to the people dying who are circumventing um, the ports of entry and being inspected when they come in because likely they know they're not going to have a favorable outcome. But I highlight the deaths in our area. 3,068 is what's listed from Border Patrol in the last 21 years. Um, Benny Hernandez, who's the chair of Brooks County, you can advance the slide. He estimates that that's, that's one-fifth of what's actually out there in the ranch lands there. And so if you imagine that we're only um, just barely scratching the surface on the people that are really being brutalized by nature, by our policies, by all these things, it, it compels us, and so I go back to that Schindler, we've, we've got to do something to make sure there are no more deaths. Um, that's the theme in Arizona, that's the theme in Brooks County. Uh, it's part of the narrative that we're all a part of. If you could advance the slide, oh let me add, those, um, go back one. Those red dots represent where bodies have been found, and the blue dots represent where water stations have been deployed. And we were talking to the advocacy committee, and so here I go down a rabbit hole. Uh, so this is the quest for coherence losing its grip. Um, but we were talking during the advocacy committee about figuring out a way to subversively get people engaged and then give them opportunities to deepen their conversion experience. And so this would be one opportunity that's part of our South Texas context and that's a tremendous need and that we could all touch people who are in desperate circumstances. Okay, now we'll move forward. We all know these statistics too, um, the numbers of people that are coming across the border that are dehumanized in that process, the people that each one of you who, who do ministries at the bus stations or at the airports encounter. Um, these are people who we've got to be a voice for their human dignity um, and for the common good that is eroded when we allow people to be treated like that. So that's part of the story. No more deaths, no more degradation. Next slide, please. Can I ask a question? Sure. Those numbers are just now, through Up through March, yeah. Yeah. No. So, and there, those have only gotten larger if you've been watching the, uh, the report. Um, and then, I know this is a lot of information, but I. Part of what all of our mission is is to help people that are stuck in the shadows who, who their legal status prevents them from being fully alive. Um, I just highlight that Texas has the second largest number of undocumented people, people that are in that circumstances, people whose, um, whose security as a human being is threatened by their legal status as an immigrant or a non-immigrant. Uh, I just, I think numbers tell a part of the story. The Rio Grande Valley has about 104,000 if their stats are accurate, so there's a, a large portion there. Um, I don't, it's hard to know what the actual numbers are in any particular community, but we know that there are a significant number of people that are compromised because of that situation. And so helping to shed light and bring people out of the shadows is part of what, what our organization is about and part of what all of our organizations are working so if you can move forward. Um, and then, I just, uh, more, so, no more, no more, but we do want more faithful citizens. There are 152,000 people, according to this database, that are eligible to naturalize. Now, there's a caveat that some of them shouldn't naturalize, they could jeopardize their legal permanent residency if they did. Um, but many people who could be facilitated to advance their um, security, by becoming U.S. citizens and then being able to participate in the political process in a more meaningful way. And so this is something that needs to be, um, it is being addressed, but you know, everything we can do to enhance that, to accelerate that is part of why we're here. So now we'll move on to J-Fund. So justice for our neighbors, uh, and, and I have to give credit to Abel um, Vega, who is over there, he's a 
member of the Rio Texas Conference staff. And he put together this slide. I've adapted it a bit, but I just love maps and it really spoke to me. Um, and it helps to give you sort of the visual of what's happening for JFON. So we began in 2014 just in terms of getting the 501c3 status and building a board and kind of that uh, portion of the story of this uh, ministry. And it wasn't until 2016 that they began to take cases. And those were primarily uh, family-based immigration cases, some humanitarian relief. Uh, the circumstances were different then, and so focus on other things hadn't become a priority as of yet. Um, what I'll say on the court is listed up there, United Methodist Committee on Relief, they were just here doing a tour of um, the South Texas area from Laredo to Del Rio just a couple of weeks ago because they're investing a lot of their resources in response to this migration uh, disaster. Um, and, and so they're one of, we were born out of Encore. Senator Justice for Our Neighbors as a Methodist ministry was born out of the Committee on Relief that helps refugees to resettle and recognize that they need to have specialized resources for people that then need to adjust their status to become um, full participants in the American society. And so that birthed JFON nationally about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago, and then recently there's been a, a greater proliferation because of what everybody is uh, living through right now. Um, so we're at the point right now, uh, and if I seem hurried and uh, a little disoriented, we were just awarded a substantial grant by Uncor to take the services that we're delivering in San Antonio and begin to offer those services in the border region as well. And that was based upon some needs assessments that were done, I mean, watching the evening news, uh, but also the knowledge that there just aren't enough resources in that area. Every, every partner that we spoke with, that was the number one. We need attorneys, we need legal services for the people living here, not just for those that are in that transition that we see on the evening news, that we hear about you know, going through respite centers, wherever they might be. But for those people that are living in the Colonias who, who don't have anywhere they can go, they may have a relief available, but they have very few options in terms of affordable legal services. So um, that's part of our future that began a few weeks ago once the award was, uh, was made. Um, there's data on the next slide that shows, but not yet, uh, that shows kind of what we've done since 2016 and where we're going. Um, I will say we began offering removal defense services about six months ago through another grant from Uncor. If you think we're Uncor dependent, so do I, so we're working on diversifying our funding streams. But um, it is a blessing to have them and to have them so committed to this ministry. Across the whole border, they're giving about a million dollars this year uh, to different ministries that are responding in, in creative ways. But the legal services, obviously, given the situation, is one of the most important uh, investments that they're making. And so when they came to the border a couple of weeks ago, we went on a little delegation to visit the other sites. We started at Travis Park, I see uh, Eric over there. And um, we then made our way to uh, Laredo, Eagle Pass, Del Rio to kind of see what's happening, see how we could be involved in helping support, um, how they could be involved in helping support and how we could take this grant and stretch it so that we can make support available there. And so what we're planning to do, uh, and what we've really gotten started, I've got three recruits, if you will, for our Border Legal Mission Corps. Um, but we're going to take what was in the grant and spread it across all of those communities by recruiting missionaries, legal missionaries. Um, both attorneys and non-attorneys. The non-attorneys uh, would get training, they would do Know Your Rights, they would do navigation services for people to find you know, when, so for those that are in that transition situation, they would be providing, um, you know, in that moment, uh, okay, when you get to Chicago, these are the organizations that you should contact because you need to have an attorney. Your chances of having a successful asylum um, determination 
are significantly increased if you have legal representation. And so that would be a part of what their mission is, um, really helping. I come out of a community organizing background, and so they, you know, I'm, I'm infusing that onto this role uh, without necessarily naming it. Uh, but I think the people that will, we've got two VISTA reps whose VISTA ends in the end of June, and I'm going to say, keep your same desk at that church, and we'll just start paying you from this. Uh, this. So God is providing, God is demanding that we uh, keep up. Um, she's got a fast pace on this, and uh, so we're doing our best. Uh, but God has also provided a legal director, a project managing attorney uh, that board approved, and so now it's just a matter of you know getting signatures on the line. Um, so we're we're really in a, an explosive growth period right now. Um, we will continue to offer services in San Antonio. Uh, and, and we will never step back from that. We're going to be, you know, our, our long-term goal is to be one JFON for the Rio Texas Conference, which is that shaded map. And there are seven districts in the Rio Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church. Right now, we're in three. We just began offering services in Corpus Christi. Um, an attorney, a case manager, and we'll be hiring a receptionist there very soon. And that's a desperate need down there. They have very few immigration attorneys, and those that they do charge market rates, and market rates are not affordable for people that don't earn a decent living. Yes? Um, the significance blue, yellow, yellow is blue circle. So I noticed that Georgetown doesn't seem to be in the conference, and yet Austin is. Yeah, so it's a big conference. Uh, I don't know. I, Georgetown is in the. Yeah, George, Georgetown is in the adjoining conference, but, but they have just as far as they can Fort Worth, Dallas, Fort Worth, and so this is just a partnership of Austin. Right. Our close proximity. So Georgetown is in the next conference north that's headquartered out of the Dallas Fort Worth area, but because Georgetown is so close to Austin, They've been running the clinic, and and the clinic model used to be what JPON's bread and butter was. Uh, we've discovered in the last several, well, last year at least, that people aren't coming to church clinics for immigration services. Um, at least not ours. Uh, I don't know. You know, the speculation is that there's fear about coming to anything that's got immigration on the name, um, and understandably so. When people are sitting outside courthouses and waiting to, you know, apprehend people. There's no reason to believe that churches will be any safer, uh, which is a sad statement. Um, in terms of the the color of the circles, I just love those. I know they have a meaning for Abel. They don't have the same meaning for me. Austin is its own separate JFON. They're not. We haven't consolidated with them yet. We've invited them, and they're they're working through some stuff. But we are delivering services now in three. Well, two and a half. I shouldn't say that. We've, we've actually been. Doing consultations at the border just on an ad hoc basis, but now we'll be able to actually dedicate resources. Um, we're hoping to have four attorneys, one, two, three, four, and then two corresponding, I'm calling them circuit writers, we'll call them DOJ accredited reps if we get the accreditation, we'll call them whatever we have to, but they're going to be doing the outreach piece and really, um, and, and one. I'll share this. In Brownsville, we met with Mike Seifert, who many of you may know. Uh, and we were doing kind of the, the next level of needs analysis, or gap analysis, and he said, somebody needs to curate the stories. That's not happening. I mean, they're horrible situations that are being shared with us on a daily basis, and there's just no bandwidth to curate those stories. And that really struck a nerve, um, especially for our subversive activities. Uh, and so, leveraging resources, you know, how many of you were at that event at Incarnate Word in the fall where they're talking about trauma and immigration? We have video, anybody video, can, video at Nowcast SA. What's that? There's video at Nowcast SA. Okay. So that one woman who does the creative writing, am I running out of time? No. It's okay. I what she said. Oh, video at Nowcast SA. That's where you can see. Is the whole thing video? Oh wow, awesome. Uh, then I will refer to that. I won't even ask anybody for the name of the uh, professor who did the creative writing with Rwandan refugees. Um, but I think that would be the avenue we'd mind 
pursue is to, to leverage universities that have these wonderfully trained people that can just work with migrants to capture their story as a therapeutic intervention and to help us curate this in a, in a respectful and dignified way uh, that, again, can help get below people's um, scales on their eyes and into their hearts. Okay. I need to take a breath. So this is what JFON has done up to this point. Um, we've had 491 total cases. This confused me at the beginning. I'm not an attorney, but you can have one person with multiple cases, so that's why they don't match up number of people and number of cases. Um, and then our removal defense work, we've had 52 clients thus far. The goal for the grant was 50 clients in a year, so I told our attorney she could take the rest of the year off, the Bahamas, whatever. Um, but she's, uh, she's been just phenomenal. She, my goal of hiring or recruiting missionaries, she was one without us having that in the job description per se. Uh, she's so dedicated to these people. Um, she spends most of her time at uh, Pearsall. She's actually down in Laredo at uh, Rio Grande Detention Center right now, defending an asylum case against the worst judge in the San Antonio region, uh, she told me as she was leaving yesterday. Um, so say a prayer that this asylum judge has mercy. Uh, she's been granted two really, uh, I mean, when she first came on, I'll share this, we said you have to do 15 cases, that's what the grant stipulates. And she thought for a second, I don't have to win 50 cases, do I? Because if I have to win, I'll have to do like 500 cases or more. And I said, no, you just have to represent 50 people to meet the, you know, and, but it was a, an important observation that she's defending people that are going to lose. With her best effort, they're going to lose because of the way the system is back against them. And that's terrible, and that's where the advocacy piece that, that needs to happen, you know, the Ninth Circuit just uh, overturned the, the Remain in Mexico ban. I, I, it's all, so everybody probably knows what I'm talking about, but government said we're going to make Remain in Mexico. The circuit court, or the whatever, district court said can't do that, that's a violation of their rights. And then the Ninth Circuit, who's supposed to be liberal, overturn that. So um, that is not the most positive news. Uh, but it just demands that we be more faithful in our citizenship and that we... Um, no, they overturned the injunction on the Trump administration's... So they reinstated the policy, at least temporarily. There was some speculation it will get overturned again, but I think the next court would be the Supreme Court, and I can't see that happening, honestly. So, um, okay, so this uh, this is just another depiction of that, um, where we're focusing our resources. Our phase one expansion already began in Corpus Christi. We're hoping to have at least two attorneys there by the year's end, and several uh, case managers. And then along the border, again, we're hoping to have This losing? Okay. Um, roughly 12 people deployed who will be providing both representation, consultations, the attorneys, and then the, uh, I'm calling them outreach education intake facilitators. It's clunky and not very, um, circuit riders is more fun. Uh, but they'll be, they'll be going from partner minister to partner ministry to partner ministry, helping to address the needs of people that have legal concerns and need to be connected with their uh, next destination. Um, okay, I think that's everything. That's the last slide? Okay. So, any questions? And thanks for asking questions in the middle. Yes. I'm Marlena Escamilla Mayor. I have a question regarding how do you get involved in this missionary for, to represent uh, some of these immigrants? Well, my target, and I'm gonna, this will sound terrible, my target is young people because they don't have responsibilities back home, <laughs> so I can underpay them oh. and stretch that further. Okay. Uh, 
At least that's my I've had a few not so young people who said they'd be willing to do it for I don't think they knew what for I didn't give them the final figure. I just said it was not a not a living wage. Um, but we're trying we're, we're working to secure housing for people so that it's more like a I come out of the Catholic tradition, a JVC experience where you live in community and then you're going out and doing your ministry and then there's you know support to do theological reflection and integration of that experience and then the self-care support. So all those components are being um, woven together right now so that we have opportunities. But like I said, the people in Eagle Pass that I sort of softly recruited already, A, it'll be an increase in their pay from Vista reps, so I feel good about that. Uh, but they live there already, and this is their ministry, whether they're getting paid for it or not, so I don't feel as bad. But our goal is to, to raise more money so that we can raise that. I do feel somewhat bad about that. But if we're paying, if we're providing a place to live, support from a church, kind of linking them with a the church, and I'm not answering your question, I'm giving more details than you asked for. Uh, and then um, health insurance, I think that's a, a reasonable, for somebody that wants to be involved in this, that has um, has the freedom to do that. So new law school grads are where we're targeting, and it doesn't have to be college grads. It doesn't have to be you know you could be a DOJ rep without a college degree. I don't know. I'm not going to go into DOJ reps, but there are some experts here who know what that process is. Although I'll also say the sad news: Casa Liber, uh, Proyecto Libertad. Does everybody know them down in uh, Harlingen? They've been around for about 30, 35 years. They do, they were DOJ accredited, or DOJ recognized for about 35 years. Their executive director told me last week they're not sure they're reapplying for their accreditation because they don't think they'll be able to meet the standards. So if they can't meet the standards, we might just have non-DOJ accredited case managers who are trained but not accredited working with an attorney you know, closely so that we maintain quality legal services, but we're not, it, it's seeming less likely we're going to be able to take advantage of that program through the government that allows people who are not attorneys to represent people in the immigration program. That's it in a nutshell. Sorry. And one more question. Um, do you have opportunities for uh, volunteering? Yes. Yeah. And, and do the volunteers get training? For yes. They will, and, and actually, our grant stipulates recruiting 20 volunteers for the border mission grant. Um, we'll probably recruit more than that, but this curating the story, that's where I want to focus the, the training and the volunteers so that we're, we're leveraging who's down there, who's, who's able to do it, and giving them the training to do it. Yes. Glad you're here today. I'm Janice from Laurel Heights United Methodist Church. How do we get in touch with you or the office to refer people to you who need your services? That is a wonderful question. <laughs> when we have a phone, um, <laughs> that's a funny statement because our phone system thorn in my side since I arrived. Um, so we're in the process of transitioning to a different phone system that I hope will make it easier. Uh, we're looking to get a 1-800 number or toll-free number that would be a central scheduling so that people could contact us, we could find resources wherever they are and be able to effectively um, connect them with legal representation. And the and I should say this, and, and the attorneys in the room know this, that just because you know we will do a consultation, it doesn't mean that people have a case, but we'll at least give them the information that they shouldn't allow themselves to be taken advantage of by an unscrupulous uh, attorney. Um, did that did I answer your question? Oh, well, I'm reluctant to give that to you until I have an 800 number. I'm, I'm meeting with AT&T tomorrow to, to finalize that. Uh, the current number is 210-847-7249, I never call it. Um, what is your email? My email is executive director at s-a-r-j-f-o-n dot o-r-g. I can give you a card if you want. 
are the legal services that you're providing, the first level legal services at the, uh, at the district level instead of at the appellate level, or do you need appellate attorneys? Well, we just filed with the Fifth um, We just filed with the Fifth Circuit yesterday uh, for a, an appeal on an Afghani individual whose asylum was denied, and then the BIA denied the appeal. And so, yes, we could probably use that additional level of support. This is our first appellate um, filing, so appeal. I'm not aware. Thank you for all the work that you do. My question is, how do you decide which removal defense cases to take? I don't. Uh, no, so, uh, well, right now we're not, she's at capacity. So right now we're trying to harm or refer people to other places that are at capacity. So, um, but her focus, first of all, it's Ben Pearsall. So it, she does the rounding in the detention center. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. She takes the ones that she thinks have the most merit. And I know that's not always a, a, an appealing answer to people. It feels like we're leaving those who don't have the best case to defend themselves, which makes them even more vulnerable. Um, I don't, I, I can put you in touch with Smiranda. I don't know what her actual process is. I know we provide, you know, without discrimination, we provide the services free, and she determines who we're going to take based upon what capacity she has, and whether, um, I do know that the, the case having merit, or having the likelihood of being successful, does factor into her determination. So, um, she's taking some that we're real, clearly not going to win, uh, and she's only won two, so I mean, even if they seem to have merit, doesn't mean they are going to win, you probably know well from your experience. Um, but she is trying to take the ones that are going to have the best chance, given the circumstances. I may be misquoting her, but I think that's her, her formula for determining a case. Um, oh, is that helpful, or is that is that what you do? I do, but I don't want to take your time. Okay. Uh, it would be probably a good discussion for all the attorneys. Hey, I know there were two other, okay. Um, I'm from Corpus Christi. Where is the office located there? Is it at First United Methodist? It's going to be at the district office when they finish renovations. We're currently uh, taking appointments, um, so not actually having office hours yet, but we are doing the appointments at First United Methodist for now. There's another church that's offered actual office space, so we're looking at that in the interim while they finish the, the renovations on the district office. Okay, I'm from a Presbyterian church, so I don't know where the district office is. Either. Oh, it's, definitely anybody know what street was it? Sound like? Galahar. Oh. Yeah, Galahar and like, uh, Castorius or something like that. Okay. It's I right around there. I live off Galahar, so I'll find it, but I just, and we've been, our Presbyterian church has been doing some work in the Colonia, too, so. Okay. Well, I'd like to talk to you after because we're looking for people to be on our advisory council down there. So, Coastal Bend District Office. And I know you had somebody back there had a hand up. Early on at the beginning, you made a remark that said um, something about naturalizing could jeopardize their LPR status. Could you explain a little bit what you're saying there? Would an attorney want to? I know that's a true statement. I don't want to speak as an attorney. Um, Fred, do you want to? No? Okay. <laughs> do you mind if I take a crack at it? Sure. Alright. So if you have a you know, DUI or some type of a felony, while in your an LPR, and then you seek to naturalize, it's my understanding that that could not only lead to being denied the right to naturalize, it could also end up causing them to revoke your LPR status. So if you have that, if you have a criminal conviction, 
it's better. But even with that, That's just in the Rio Grande Valley. and lose your LPR status that way. My understanding is if you have that conviction when you try to reapply for your LPR, they can also... Right. Right. Yeah, if you have a conviction, you're an LPR, but you get some other violation, it could all spiral quickly. Sorry. Did I... So at the um, citizenship workshop that's coming up this Saturday at SAC, uh, that will be one of the question or one of the issues to work through with people who have eligibility to naturalize, at least on paper. That if you have a an aggravated felony conviction, don't even think about it. Now, is it true? My, I know we've got it. I'm sorry. Yeah. It starts at nine, he's going eight to get free tacos. It should go to about one or two. It's a citizenship uh, information workshop. Oh, okay. And again, this, this won't be valid until like July 1st or something. Uh, Can I just ask you really quick on that? I volunteered at one of these citizenship workshops, and the idea is that you help people fill out the form and screen for any issues, and if there's anything that seems slightly problematic, and that could be at the level of one DUI, um, it's recommended that person go to a lawyer and do an in depth legal consultation. These issues are very, very The address of the office in San Antonio, 3510 Gallagher Road for those, I mean in Corpus Christi, 3510 Gallagher. Any other, I know we need to wrap up. I've been given, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. We'd like to know about uh, another organization and an update on another organization that is part of our mission. Um, Lena, I'm going to ask my co-chair, Lena Baxter, to leave the Reports. This is the time for reports of the different ministries that we do. Um, uh, as we work with each 
legislature in hanging our heads. Uh, virtually nothing on immigration, as you know, and a number of really other issues that are quite disappointing. But two years for me and everything. So we started to focus on the 2020 elections and what can we do in the elections, uh, in the lead up to the elections, in order to um, make a difference in the way people think and hopefully the way they vote. Um, and our prayer today was to look at these wonderful stained glass windows here and how powerfully they speak to faith and draw people into faith. And one of the things that we looked at, the numerous ways that we want to uh, bring the message, uh, are ways that move um, from hearts of stone to hearts of flesh, as we call to by the Lord, by prophets and, and faith people throughout the ages. And so we looked at... Um, the wonderful resources that Elizabeth from the Baptist Federation has bringing in terms of using labyrinth art exhibits, etc., uh, churches at various places that tell the story of immigration today in a way that captures the mind and the heart. And also to um, use stories, I was just brought up by Matt, and I had sent the minutes of our in between meeting to Mary Grace, and she sent. This interfaith welcome committee, one minute miracles with pictures and short stories by different of our volunteers. This is especially during the time when we had our last crisis and we had all the people living and sleeping and working and all the rest of it at the uh, Mennonite Church and their powerful. But we have many people involved in the ministry in a variety of ways whose hearts have been touched by the realities of people's lives. So we keep capturing those, finding ways to distribute them, certainly use our Facebook and our website, and through uh, any possible way that we can get into different places and tell the story. We also want to be very much part of what are possible solutions? What are the ways forward? We are surrounded by so much changing information. We have got to be accurate, effective, and put things in people's minds that um, can inform the judgment as well as the mind as well as the heart. This today I take it off from the website of the Hope Border Institute down in um, El Paso, which is the Ciudad de Juarez as well as, as in El Paso. And they have this one flyer that's simply about um, guide to asylum at the border. Now we just had about 18 questions about lawyers and asylum law issues, and they're huge. But this was so helpful, both in terms of vocabulary, process, and the more we can find visuals like this, and those ways of taking complexity and being true to the complexity, but in a way that people can grasp and can explain as well as support. So one of the best ways in which we uh, are able to advocate and do bring people towards uh, to do justice is by our ministers. We have a whole list of them that we did. A whole list of them up there before. And not every ministry fits every person as we well know. It's one of the ways that people start to ask questions and start to wonder. And these are great gifts that we can give to the communities that we serve. So look out for your email, for the Facebook, for the web page. And we'll be updating you as we do these different uh, these different ways of telling your story and moving parts. And if you want to belong to the advocacy committee, I'll be over here in the corner. Please go email. You know, call me. Though. I'm such a mess up when it comes to all this stuff. Like so just, you can call me. Oh, you can do this too, but it takes longer because I'm losing somewhere in that computer trying to run my life. Do I feel plagued? Okay, but I think we're on to some really um, powerful things in the way that we want to tell the story and the way that we want to move hearts. And if you have ideas that are beyond that or want to add to them, please see me after me. And it's all certain. Okay, 
Okay, Chris, do you have anything with the fake name? Um, we have, I just wanted to announce about our lunch uh, groups that work at various churches and prepare 50 double meals in brown bags and bring them to the bus station almost every day. But there are still some days that they don't bring them. If you think that your church might be interested in hosting a, a, a lunch group, um, let me know or let Don Silvius know. She's not here today. And, um, and we'll set you up. At my church, we do it with eight people. Everybody brings carrots or bread or meat or cheese or cookies or uh, Ziploc bags, and we do it in an hour and drive it down to the bus station. So it is a, a good first step for someone who wants to help but doesn't know how. I would also like to ask you to either pick up an invitation to our volunteer dinner that's on the table out there. I, we hope that everyone has received some by email. And please RSVP so we can have a plate for you. Thank you. Um, does anyone like collaboration want to speak? Uh, yes, our guest speaker next, uh, at our next meeting is Sister Pam Buganski. Uh, she's down in the valley right now and we're going to be learning about some of the ministry there. She's very active in Eskin for, for years. And one other note is that we could use somebody back here with me and uh, a semi tanky person can be trained easily just to run these and uh, be able to process things. Like during the meeting, I have I have a an envelope here from somebody in Maine uh, that is donating money. I think they came down and volunteered. But this is the kind of thing that that we could use another person back here. Or so I can get sick sometime. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe take a nap. Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, the next racing, I'll, there's not much to say. I did talk with Gene um, Helm and our treasurer and there is a financial report on the table. We didn't feel like it was necessary for Jean to tell you what's on the paper because you can read that for yourself. But as you see, we do have money, but we are spending a lot of money. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anyone here who's going to talk about backpacks, but um, the last time I looked at our backpack numbers, which was about maybe three or four days ago, we had already delivered 11,000 backpacks. So if you extrapolate that through the year, uh, that's going to be close to maybe 36000 35000 And uh, so we are going to have to raise money eventually. And uh, if you have uh, a church group that accepts grants, or if you know where we can write a grant to receive money for this ministry, please let me know. Um, okay, and the, so the next one is uh, Sister Susan Mika with our wonderful newsletters. Uh, for those that are new, I'm Sister Susan Mika. I'm with the Benedictine Sisters in our monasteries in Burnley. And what we've been able to contribute to the coalition is every month we try to put together a number of the articles. It's not every article, but many, uh, because uh, it helps to document what's going on. And uh, it, I know not everyone has... Um, subscriptions to all of these and like in order to pull them off and read the whole article you have to have the subscription oftentimes so um and Ruben uh, it helps me and Nina right here and if anyone doesn't have a copy could you just raise your hand and Ruben will run around and see if yes make sure everyone's got a copy as we just go through um the first article that we have on there uh we just put in, I don't like these words that the uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection uses, but it, you know these are some of their um, uh, press releases and all that they put out. So we have, uh, you know, again, how many people are crossing and uh, into our areas. And so, you know, some of the earlier uh, slides up there were just like one, uh, you know, our area, but these, are, of course, are talking about all of the different as well. 
Uh, the second article there, Judge gives Trump officials six months to find every child. Remember uh, Judge uh, Dana Sabra, uh, he's a U.S. District Judge out of the uh, San Diego area, and he gave the administration six months to identify every child uh, that they separated as part of that zero tolerance policy. So, uh, you know, we've said before, he single-handedly has taken on this and is making these uh, judgments, and I pray for him every day because, I mean, he's made such a difference in this whole uh, area of the children. And um, then the White House asked Congress for $4.5 in emergency spending. That was new uh, this week as well. Um, I'm just going to keep on going because there's so much that we have, you know, in, in this time. But, you know, you can read all the different articles that we put down there. Uh, Trump is wasting our immigration crisis. Many of you read uh, Thomas Friedman, and this was his um, op-ed in the New York Times the other week. Uh, if you get a chance to read the whole thing, it's, it's uh, he's just pretty awesome. He puts so much into, um, you know, everything that he writes. But he's talking about, like, what can we do out of this crisis? It's sort of, you know, some of the things that, that um, you know, can be done, could be done with this instead of wasting, you know, so much time about what we're talking about here. Um, this next article, it, this was in our paper um, just yesterday or so. Uh, immigrant, immigrants contribute billions to the San Antonio economy, so we felt like it was really important to put that in. All of the different ways um, that immigrants are helping in our economy here, uh, instead of using all the negativity. Uh, the family separations, the uh, homeland security to test DNA of families at the border in cases of suspected fraud. Um, this is supposed to start any day. I, don't, I haven't really heard whether it's actually started, but trying to test the DNA to see if these children are the children of the people that they're accompanying. So uh, when we say unprecedented, uh, it just keeps on taking new uh, meaning. <laughs> So, um, and then the detention centers, you've heard that uh, we're establishing two more detention centers, like tent cities, uh, and so, you know, this is just an article uh, from the Texas uh, Tribune talking about that, and then we have a picture there, um, one's going up in El Paso and the other in Donna, and uh, we go down along the Rio Grande, so. Another person has died, unaccompanied immigrant person has died, 16-year-old in our government's custody. And then the last article on that page, a pediatrician who treated immigrant children describes a pattern of lapses in medical care and shelters. This is in ProPublica, and one of our Benedictine sisters that we work with in Alabama, she knows this person that has been um, writing some of these stories. So we encourage, uh, you know, we wanted to put this out there because a lot of people don't see this, but this person is trying to, again, document what's going on on the medical side. You know, here we're talking about a lot of the lawyer stuff, but there's a lot that goes on there, too, on the medical side. The next page, uh, you know, Cory Booker and House Democrats introduced most ambitious bill yet to try to curb immigration detention. Um, ICE is holding $204 million in bond money, and some immigrants may never get it back. You know, this is one of those things we were talking about in our advocacy committee meeting, too. When the case is closed, the bond is supposed to be returned. So uh, how do we find out how many cases have been closed, and then have those bonds been returned? And, um, you know, I depend on people like Fred and others, like, please help us try to find out the answers to some of these kinds of questions. Uh, some of you that are new, you know, a while back, the, the person put out, like, a GoFundMe page to raise, like, $1,500 for a bond and raised $20 million actually, for Raices and the bond funds. And so those funds have been expended over time. I don't know if anyone's here from Raices. But, you know, to say how much has been expended, but, you know, this, they're supposed to be returned, the money is supposed to be returned, and Sister Pat reminded us that it's supposed to be with interest uh, when the case is closed. So, uh, so we just continue to document, you know, that this is what's out there. 
Um, John Kelly, our, uh, the former chief of staff, joined the board of the company operating the largest shelter for unaccompanied migrant children. And uh, that uh, he was part of that Clyburn company, and now he's gone onto that board. So. Uh, the, uh, under asylum seekers, the Pope donated 500000 for migrants stranded in Mexico, and it says in there that uh, through the Catholic Church's uh, Peter Pence Fund, it's taken up, I believe it's in June every year, uh, that they're going to be distributing among 27 projects in 16 dioceses and among some Mexican religious congregations that have uh, asked for help. So, um, as, as you know, he feels very strongly about all of this. And um, then these uh, next two are about whether or not asylum seekers are going to have to pay a fee in order to apply for asylum. And so uh, this was a new wrinkle that just came out. Well, this article is May the 1st, and then the second one is May the 7th. And um, so we'll just continue to follow that. It's, an, it's never been done before, and you know I don't think any um, amounts have been set. But you know, to, just to let everyone know that this is what's happening. Um, and then this court case on the bottom there uh, about keeping the asylum seekers in Mexico was already mentioned, so I won't go into that. But then developing stories, which we have at the back there, slowdowns at the border ports of entry could cost Texas billions. Uh, you've seen that perhaps on the news where the trucks are so backed up. And I, I know from my work many years ago on the Maquila Doras, you know, these trucks are uh, going back and forth every day across that those bridges in order to bring things into our border part, ports and then go on to other parts of the United States. So as the slowdowns happen, it adds hours and hours and hours, you know, to those truck drivers' lives, and then um, things can't get across in a timely fashion. And, um, you know, when we were working with the uh, Kiladora factories, they have everything down to, like, this delivery on time. You know, it's, it's a very, uh, a process that minutes count, you know, between getting across and then, like, Transporting things like from here all the way on 35, you know, 35 ends in Minnesota. <laughs> so, you, you, know, you know how some of those kinds of things go. So, this is very, very concerning to so many of the businesses and the companies that, uh, that we work with also. Um, and then just Trump naming, naming Mark Morgan, former head of Border Patrol, to lead ICE. Um, and then, um, you know, this last article on that page, Trump administration proposal would make it easier to deport immigrants who use public benefits. That concept's been around uh, for a few months now and, you know, tightening up to see where that's going to go. And the last article that we put on here, um, as you know, uh, the work that our, the Benedictine Sisters and many other groups do uh, is around shareholder activism. And so the GEO group, which is the one that runs the, uh, the facility at Harms, had their annual meeting about two or three days ago now. And um, the Jesuits and many other groups that had bought the shares in order to be able to file the shareholder resolution um, under the second little uh, star there, we have what the resolution asks of the company. Uh, it's, it's called like the Be It Resolved, so it says specifically the proposal Be It Resolved stated, shareholders request that GEO report annually on its website to investors beginning in September 2019 on how it implements the portion of the policy that addresses respect for our inmates and detainees including, you know, what they're aware of around human rights and metrics to assess human rights performance, including any process for independent outside verifications of such metrics and how it remedies shortcomings in their human rights performance. This actually passed. Uh, so this is like a little miracle <laughs> in itself uh, because usually our resolutions, I think I've reported to you before, the first year we have to have 3%, the second year 6%, the third year and every year thereafter 10%. 
So we don't know the vote because they didn't actually announce how many shares were voted, but they just said that more shareholders voted for the proposal than against it, and then they usually have three to four days to actually report the numbers to the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, which is the one that governs our work. So we don't have that yet, but we know that it passed, whatever that means. And um, then someone just sent me an article this morning that is in Newsweek that um, the private prison company Geo Group says activists pose a risk to the bottom line. So now we're a risk to the bottom line. So I have reported, I think at the last, uh, our last meeting that you know several of the banks, including J.P. Morgan Chase and uh, Wells Fargo, uh, had said they were not going to finance any more expansion of facilities for the private prisons. So uh, now the company is filing this uh, with um, you know the powers that be that say that uh, we are at risk to their um, bottom line, and it's. True in many ways, I guess we are. So, <laughs> but uh, it's going to be in Newsweek today online. So we'll put that in this uh, portion, you know, before we make it into the PDF and send it to those that, um, you know, ask us for that, and also to, um, you know, put it on the website. Sister Sharon and others help us get it posted. So, so that's it in a nutshell. So thank you. Hi, I'm Moon Brand. I am the coordinator for the San Antonio Sanctuary Network accompaniment team. And just quickly, because there's some new people here, what uh, this court, this group of volunteers does is we basically will go with uh, asylum seekers to their different appointments. It could be check-ins, it could be court, it could be their ankle shackle monitoring um, appointments, and we're there to hold space. We're there to think of it in terms as a mobile sanctuary. Second pair of eyes, second pair of ears to just help the process because it's it's very nerve-wracking for them and it's very tense. So if you're interested or if your church or organization that is interested, I'd be more than happy to go and present to your uh, to whatever group, even if it's in the home, anything, because it's not only about the volunteers, it's about people being informed to what people are having to go through. Okay, so there's that. Uh, and any changes here in Sanctuary is that one big change in the last couple of months is there's been a lot of last minute calls where the ICE agent will call the asylum seeker and say, you need to come in now. And they don't have a car. They, you know, in San Antonio it's difficult to get from one place to another with mass transit. And so, it's very stressful, and they're and they're basically bullied into if you don't come, then you can get deported. And so, of course, they call me seven o'clock in the morning. I have to go. I have to go. So I'm like, okay, I'll get there as soon as I can. So if there's anyone who loves that sort of early morning adrenaline rush, talk to me. We can work together on this. And, and they're so appreciative. They know that you, I just got you out of bed, and here you are, and here we go. And, and it, that's happening more often than not. So that's one thing. Another thing is um, uh, we're going to have some, uh, a little gathering this Saturday. Uh, it's right up there. At the First Unitarian Universalist Church. So, some of you know that we have three people in sanctuary in Austin. And they were just denied, they're basically being told you're going to get deported. So, they're still in sanctuary in the safety of the uh, two different churches in Austin. Two are adults and one is a child. And so, there are expenses to be in sanctuary. There's food, there's clothes, there's medicine, and different things, cell phone. So, we're going to have a fun Razor type of event where it's not only just information, it's also time for people to come together and share their experiences or their ideas through music, through poetry, through, um, through art. So that's happening this Saturday at San Antonio uh, Universe, uh, Unitarian Universalist Church. 
And uh, it's something different because we're also going to have a lawyer there to ask, uh, uh, to express <laughs> what the, what's going on, all things immigration, and then also to ways for other people to get involved. But it's also a time for us to take care. I mean, there's something in the, in the form of art that allows you to release what you're experiencing in, in this work. Right, so we have any questions about flyers, and if you need me, I'm there. Thanks. Uh, Sister Denise, do you have something? And why don't we, we are you know, thinking about time. So, Sister Denise, uh, Barbara, Evans, uh, and John. Yes, John and Joe. Both of them, they want to come up. Okay, um, I do have some numbers for backpacks. Um, in April at the bus station was 2,401. Um, the year to date for the bus station has been 8,616. Is that wrong? 8,616. Year to date. 2,401. The airport total for the year so far is 3,312, and for the month of April is 996. Okay. Um, things just keep moving and changing and everything else. The detention center numbers are down, but the numbers from Eagle Pass are way up. So we've been working a lot for evening hours, um, getting our volunteers cover the evenings also for the people coming through, but also the Eagle Pass people being dropped off. Um, so I guess the, the biggest news is really um, about Eagle Pass and Del Rio. Um, we've been in communication with um, Eagle Pass and they've been doing some sheltering down there and we've worked very hard with them to, for them not to drop off people after 10 at night. Um, so the shuttles are aware of that and they get scolded every once in a while. And um, so, um, so that's, the, that's helpful instead of disrupting the whole shelter um, at night. Um, <clears throat> Del Rio, um, there's a group down there that's been in touch and they came to San Antonio to visit. They have um, a, a nice coalition of many different places down there. And they were trying to get in order because they heard that there's going to be lots of releases in Del Rio. Um, up till now, so recently, the They've been bringing a bus each day from Del Rio to uh, Homeland Security Border Patrol, bringing a bus load to Eagle Pass to release an Eagle Pass. But um, the hot off the press is that in addition to the bus that goes to Eagle Pass, it will be dropped off in Del Rio, but they're, they're going to start transporting people from McAllen to Del Rio to be processed by Border Patrol. Since there's an overwhelming number, um, they figure, you know, the Del Rio Border Patrol needs more work. So it's going to be two to four buses a day um, that are going to go from McAllen all the way to Del Rio. So um, I, I don't know how it's going to work. I mean, why transport those people all those hours? Um, there's very little transportation. Aguila Express is there so they can shuttle up here, but they're so busy with all their vans and Eagle Pass, so I don't know how that will work. And there is a Greyhound there, um, well, the Stripes gas station has a, a, a place where the Greyhound comes through. So um, it's really unknown how that will affect everybody and everything, but we'll probably see our numbers even go higher. And um, the city continues to do an amazing job running the resource center. Helping with all that, Catholic charities helping with the tickets um, and Nathaniel driving. Um, so it's been a great experience of having all those groups uh, work together without any push for ego awards. <laughs> so. Okay, um, she gave you the backpack number, so it's getting pretty high there at the airport. But um, I just wanted to mention, too, that with Pearsall, um, a lot of times they're coming, they're being dropped off by, in a 
van, you know, like immigration van or something at the airport without any notification. And so recently we had like eight. I saw a guard taking eight. He passed us up and he goes, oh, these are mine. These aren't yours. Don't worry about them. And we had our own, our own people uh, that we were helping, our own families. And so we said, okay. And then we see four of them later just, you know, wandering around the airport looking at monitors and totally lost. So I went up to him and talked to him and they had nothing. Um, one, one knew his confirmation number, the others didn't know anything. And so um, we got the airlines to help, American Airlines got, we eventually got them all out, got them tickets, but it was just, it was just like, we didn't even know they were coming. And I'm just glad I saw them because then they would have missed their flights and everything else. So we, we need to look into that. And also, we haven't had any any arrivals from cars. Right? Where's Sister Denise? Did you know that? At the airport in May? They're adults. They're just adults, single adults. Right. Okay. But they've been few and far between. But um, that's basically it. And I do appreciate, I wanted to give a shout out to the City Resource Center, Center that's processing the families that are just dropped off, you know, in front of the bus station. They're, they're actually, they're calling us now that they're bringing somebody. And so, it's so helpful because um, we, we need to know that, you know, and have enough backpacks. And uh, they're so appreciative when they get there. So, that's all I have. Every time I think of Joe, her email address is Joe Mama, so that's my really life. <laughs> that's what she is. She's mama to a lot of folks. So. <laughs> uh, it has been some week uh, since the IWC has uh, begun taking over the operation of the shelter, the overnight shelter at Travis Park. Up until, I lost track of time, two weeks ago. Uh, the city handled not only the city, the resource center, but also the overnight shelter. And uh, they asked us if we could take that over, and how could we not? And, uh, and so we have been recruiting volunteers and uh, orienting volunteers every night for the last uh, week and a day. And it's been an awesome week, it really has, just to see the, the volunteers um, stepping up coming over, uh, scheduling, and uh, being there for their orientations. And, and since we're creating this as we go, uh, it's just awesome to hear the wonderful ideas that bubble up from the, from the volunteers, uh, ideas that we, I, wouldn't think of because I'm dealing with the basics. And, uh, and so I really appreciate the, the fresh, fresh ideas and great creative suggestions, offerings. Uh, we, to give you an idea of numbers, um, prior to the end of March when the numbers shot through the roof, we were averaging about 100 to 125 uh, overnight people per month. Since March 29th, which is just a little over a month ago, we've sheltered 2,540, quite a job uh, for, for just a little over a month. And this is, is a Travis Park. Um, yeah. It's uh, at Travis Park Methodist Church, uh, two, two blocks away from the bus station, which is the ideal uh, location because it can, you can walk there from the bus station. We do. Uh, orientation is offered uh, an hour before any volunteer's first shift. So, uh, so if you if you volunteer, if you sign up to uh, for the seven to ten shift, uh, the orientation actually begins at at six thirty. So there's a kind of speaking, showing around orientation for an hour, and then the rest of it is hands on. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I'm Joe Mom. <laughs> uh, there was one night. Uh, there, was, there was one. Uh, yeah, there was one night. The the night when we had the highest number. Our 
up to that point, we had been seeing about 50 overnights at the shelter each night. The night that it shot up to 165 in one night, we had one volunteer that was being oriented that night. And I thought, what are we going to do with one volunteer? And But I, you know, you know soldier forth. And uh, Chili and Peggy uh, showed up unannounced, unscheduled. They just showed up to see what it looked like, see what it, what's going on. Needless to say, they went to work immediately, took charge, and it was awesome. And another another uh, person, a uh, Methodist minister, uh, showed up to pray. <laughs> Needless to say, not a whole lot of praying. Well, yeah, a whole lot of praying went on, but not the kind she had in mind. So she, she so it worked out. It worked out. So things like that just have gone on all week. It's just been awesome. And uh, so I would be surprised if all of you haven't received some email about the need for volunteers, if not several emails coming from all different directions. Um, and the response has really been wonderful. Uh, almost too much to even respond to in a timely fashion. Um, uh, but we're adding, we're the, we still need overnight people from, uh, from 9.30 at night until 7 o'clock in the morning. That's the most difficult. Ooh, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, it's listed as 8. I keep hoping that people could leave at 7. Okay, yeah, it's listed as 8, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, the, so it's the most difficult for people to commit to, I think. Um, but you do get to rest, you do get to sleep. Um, they're, you're not the only one. And, um, and once the, everybody's asleep, and before they all wake up, hey, it's a piece of cake, right? This is your JT. <laughs> um, but we're adding another shift. And the other shift, the, the new shift, is early morning from 6.30 to 8.30. We know that there are many who, who simply can't do the after, you know, volunteering late at night or overnight, uh, but there are a lot of early birds. And uh, so we need four volunteers each morning from uh, 6.30 to 8.30 uh, so that we can continue sheltering the families that have early morning departures. Uh, one other thing, we have um, a father and a son, Santos and, and Garrison, who um, arrived, I don't know when they, it's been a month. Uh, I think they arrived about a month ago and spent time with Chili and Peggy, and then went to, when Chili and Peggy had to go out of town, they went to another volunteer's home. And so they've been sheltered, they don't have a sponsor. And this is just the most difficult thing to deal with. Uh, we are desperately searching for a sponsor. Um, preferably outside of Texas. And uh, they'd like to go to California. Um, and we are looking, and Catholic Charities is helping us to look. But if anybody has any connections with faith communities or people who want to sponsor a family, a big job, uh, please let us know. Let me know. Before uh, John, before you speak, um, Eric. <laughs> Eric. Uh, Travis Park is the church that has opened their doors to establish the shelter. And my understanding is I mean, we need an actual paid staff, and that uh, job description was put on Facebook, I believe, yesterday or the day before. But one of the things I have seen that has been so inspiring for me, because I've worked in nonprofit work my whole career, and that is that we have all these different groups that are coming together. In an humble way of service. And so Catholic Charities, uh, Travis Park, and the city of San Antonio, I believe, are working on getting that paid staff position set. And speaking of Travis Park, is there a gentleman over here? I think all of us deserve to have a happy day. I'm going to go to the National Church Park Church. Um, yeah, it's been a Herculean effort, and I'm so grateful for all of you who've um, served in lots of different ways. Uh, it's a big 
volunteer ask uh, to do all these overnights and to do it well, um, to provide real hospitality and safety um, for folks, and that's really what we're, what we're seeking to do. And so I'm so glad that hopefully we can ease some of that. We will still need volunteers, for sure, um, but we can hopefully ease some of that volunteer burden um, by putting together this paid position. And so you may know the right person who could work uh, an 11-hour shift uh, a few nights a week and um, pay, as I, I believe we're looking at $15 an hour. Um, that person needs Spanish, um, but uh, yeah, you might know the right person. And so uh, I'll try to put this on the um, uh, IWC Facebook page. But it's, it's, not, it's already there. Oh, it's already there, good. Uh, so check out travispark.org slash employment. Um, we're hoping to get some of these hires done um, in the next several days and started, you know, hopefully in the next couple of weeks when we have the money in hand, which of course we can always pray <laughs> for that too. Um, but really grateful for the partnership of uh, Catholic Charities and the City of San Antonio being willing to, to help pony up um, part of the expense. Uh, Travispark.org. Sorry. Uh, so we're called Travis Park Church, and our website is called Travis Park. Dot org. So T R A V I S P A R K, which is the name of the park across the street. Dot org um, and uh, slash employment is uh, where you can find the application. Um, yeah. So basically, all that Lena said. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to say that and um, do do share that because uh, we'd love to get the person hired or people. It would probably be two or three people. <laughs> We're so grateful to Travis Park because this is a big deal to open up. I mean, 80, I think I saw 80 people. I don't know if that's your highest number, Joe, but I see them every morning. And to have that many people come and see your church is a big deal. Well, Thank you. again, we're glad to offer what we can. What we can is always changing. Uh, I just wanted to mention, too, that we've run into a, a fairly significant uh, plumbing problem. <laughs> and so uh, we have moved uh, from the third floor down to the basement, where we're also doing our um, ministry with our street friends. I think logistically we're going to be able to work it all out. But So we're now sheltering folks uh, as of last night uh, in the fellowship hall uh, downstairs. And so um, we're trying to work on the plumbing issue. But... Um, we just keep moving forward. And I'm John from the Mennonite Church. We're working on triaging uh, specifically pregnant mamas out of the shelter every night so they can come and stay in our hospitality house um, where they can take showers and be a little bit more comfortable. Um, but I, I want to I wanna, um, also note that if Joe hasn't sold it to you yet, it is a wonderful opportunity to volunteer with a good friend or a group of friends. I mean, this is a finely tuned volunteer operation, and it is really exciting uh, to, to do, and you get to meet a really diverse group of people from the city and various things, and it's just a, it's just a, how many folks have done this already? Have they done, look at this, look around, look around. And give a thumbs up, it was a great experience. All right, um, so, 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 Write down that Joe Mama uh, email address and, and get in on this. This has also allowed us to do longer term sheltering um, for folks after spending time with that family um, who lost their baby in the river. Um, they were here at, at, um, at Methodist Hospital. We were uncovered talking to the social workers that there's a whole bunch of medical emergencies that are coming up from the border and families are stranded at the hospital waiting for their, their children and whatnot. So we're hosting um, a couple families here long term, and the social workers are saying that this is a regular thing. So if anyone knows folks, I don't know the medical center very well, but if anyone knows faith communities or folks who'd be interested in doing hospitality up in that area, because the transportation back and forth between here and the, and the uh, medical center it take, it takes a little bit. Um, but that's that's a that's a that's a beautiful outgrowth of all of this incredible collaboration. And we talked about some of the miracles that are happening. And I think we have to recognize the miracle of the collaboration that's happening in our city. Um, it is really really fabulous. I was spending one night with a, a woman who works in the library and a guy who works in a Head Start and a guy in our church who four years ago was a crazy you know, survivalist with his guns, and now I found Jesus, and he wants to help the immigrants. 
and then someone in the city who works in the drilling. Like they, he drills underneath sidewalks. And we're all just hanging out all night, showing people to the bathroom and whatnot. And you just see this image of this beautiful collaboration. It's really, it's really miraculous. So we have to give, we have to give thanks. Okay, we really want to hear from our collaborators, so if y'all can just kind of make a way up here so we can get through this fast. Is there anyone who would like to make an announcement about their organization? Sarah, I'm so glad you're here. Nate. Yes, you may. Uh, just this whole thing about the volunteering, I really, really would like us to work with Anne Helmke and all of the churches that are here. I, re I see that this would be a magnificent way to extend our work, that every church is approached to provide that number of volunteers each night so we can do that. So we're not just depending upon the same people all the time. I think we need to outreach to those churches. Hi, everyone. For those of you I have Meeting. Uh, my name is Sarah Ramey, and I work at the Migrant Center for Human Rights. Um, we, have, we have a couple different um, announcements today. The first is that the Friends Meeting of Washington is hosting a spring fair that we're participating in. Um, it's going to have a variety of children's activities, uh, things that you can purchase if you're looking for Mother's Day gifts. Um, as part of our month of Mother's Day fundraising efforts, we will be there uh, selling food and agua fresca. We will also have some food available today um, if folks would like to join me in conversation about some of these issues after the meeting is done um, or buy some food to take home to support us in our efforts um, working with the detained individuals at Pierce Hall. Um, so I want to mention just a couple of things very briefly, and I am going to pass around a newsletter sign up. If anyone is not on our newsletter and wants to receive it, we're going to try to send one out next week um, with some of the announcements. Um, some of them are going to be repetitive of the great announcements that IWC put together for you. Um, but there are um, announcements of our organization as well as an immigrant voice story and a public policy analysis. Um, and then we might have a few hard copies of that, some of our past newsletters um, here at Flash if people want to look at this. So um, one case that's really important that people are aware of is matter of MS. This is where the Attorney General uh, basically decided that immigrants who cross the border without documents and who are seeking asylum are not going to be eligible for a bond uh, before an immigration judge. They're going to be relying on ICE to release them or not release them. Incredibly problematic. Um, we have an op-ed that we did on this issue a number of months ago that I encourage you to read to, to understand more about the ICE um, parole and bond determination processes. Um, but this is a big concern. It's under lit litigation right now. There have been rumors that some of the judges are trying to apply it, even though it's not supposed to be active for 90 days. Um, so I encourage people to be aware of that. Can I say just a show of hands? How many of you know that the immigration courts are not independent? That they're under the Department of Justice? Okay. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we've advocated for, as well as a lot of na uh, larger national Church here has been very uh, helpful to us. There's a Toyota, Toyota Prius out in this near parking lot. Does anybody have a Toyota Prius? Yes, yeah. Okay, we've got a 2NRXG license plate. Because they're such good hosts, we have to break in and make this announcement. Toyota Prius, if you think that you are parked right close to the door, please park off here. Are we okay? It's not us? Thank you. 
Um, I do want to mention also we do have volunteer opportunities uh, for people who have language skills, people who have medical skills, uh, and then of course lawyers, law students, for work. So please speak with me. Um, we have a wait list right now for our services of about 25 people. Those are individuals that we currently cannot um, help as much as we want to because of our capacity and our funding limitations. Um, and I will have to go up with memory. Um, so we had an asylum win. Um, if for those of you who do get our newsletter, we did a case appeal last month. Um, we have a win from one of those cases, and I just want to share this letter that I received yesterday. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I know we are short of time. Um, this letter came in yesterday from the lady who won asylum, and she says, um, "Glory to God, I won my case um, at the end of April." And I want to thank you infinitely um, today, tomorrow, and forever to you and your colleagues for all the work that you do and um, to your family. And I, I want to read this letter because I think that applies to all of you as well and your support of our work and support of um, immigrants in the community. Um, so we, you know, we need to appreciate the ones when we get them because as Matt said earlier, you know, it's, it's not all cakes and roses. Um, I do also want to thank, and she's not here yet, but um, our volunteer legal assistant, Daniela, who's spoken at previous meetings. Um, she's been with us for about three months now. She's going to be moving on to, because she needs to find paid employment. Um, and so I want to extend a thank you to her for all of her help. Um, and then I want to let folks know as well that we have a National Day of Action today um, to call your members of Congress to encourage them to not support this additional $4.5 billion in funding. Um, the number to get a hold of your member of Congress is on our Facebook page. I just posted before coming to the meeting. So if any of you don't have Facebook and you need that, I can try to look it up for you um, today. But we encourage you to get involved um, in that. And that's it. Hey everybody, I'm Nate and I work at Raices. Um, our announcement this month is about our Pachanga, happening next Tuesday from 6 to 8 p.m. at our 802 Kentucky Avenue office. And we're going to be talking about everything we do. I'll be there talking about bonds, because that's what I do. And uh, I hope to see you there. And uh, there'll be food and drinks, and it should be a good time. So thanks a lot. else? Okay, we have a couple of announcements, or at least one. Um, we have our volunteer appreciation dinner at Laurel Heights United Methodist Church on May 17th at 6.30. Uh, you RSVP and there is the email address for you sending your RSVP. We want all of you are invited. We want you to come. Um, this has been a hard year of work. Um, and I am in awe of each of you and what you do every day because um, you are truly an inspiration. So we hope that you will uh, RSVP for this event and come and join us uh, in celebration of the work we've done. Uh, is there anything else? Oh, yes. Sorry, I forgot to do this, but you can just look over here. May 18th, First University. Universalist Church at 10 o'clock, the regular meeting. And also the site and release press conference is going to be next week, which means that the city is beginning this new policy of citing the people that we explained to you before. Okay, I'm not sure it's, if it's Wednesday night or Thursday night. It sounds like the DA is uh, speaking of it on Thursday night. And in the morning, this Saturday, is the general meeting. Not this Saturday, but the 18th. But this next week, Wednesday or Thursday night, will be the press conference. Excuse me, when you said site and release, are you spelling site, C-I-T-E, and then release? We're, we're fixing it now. Oh, it, it should have been C-I-T. Thank you. I think also want to thank you all for being here and uh, for being involved in the work that we're doing with families who need our help. So thank you very much. See you next month. Or before this.